Rat killing, combined with basic measures of rat proofing and sanitation, constitutes a major step in permanent rat control. But rat killing by itself does not result in permanent rat control. So long as food sources and harborage remain undisturbed, killing rats merely lessens competition for those that survive. With less competition, rapid reproduction rebuilds the population. Soon, the infestation is as great as ever. When a building has been rat-proof to keep rats out, it is possible to eliminate all rats within the premises by the techniques of rat killing. It is the rat eradicator's job to get rid of every last rat remaining in the premises. One surviving pregnant female might cause a reinfestation that would completely nullify the effort and expense of rat proofing. The tools of rat killing are various rodenticides and mechanical devices. The selection and use of these tools depends upon the area to be made rat free. For instance, in this rat-proofed restaurant kitchen, no chances should be taken with the poison that rats might spread to human food. In this case, red squill is selected as the rodenticide. Red squill is relatively safe around humans and most domestic animals, since it is in itself an emetic and is normally regurgitated before lasting harm is done. But the rat cannot regurgitate and retains the poison. For this reason, red squill is the most commonly used rodenticide. But the problem is to get the rat to eat the red squill. Red squill is bitter. Therefore, it must be mixed with food that is highly acceptable to rats. A poison bait is prepared of fresh, lean ground beef and chicken mash mixed with red squill. Salad oil is added as a binder. The mixture is prepared in small amounts called torpedoes for distribution to the rats. An alternate cereal poison bait is prepared of steam rolled oats ground bacon, and red squill. Experience has shown that better results are obtained if a choice of food baits is offered to the rats. Again, salad oil is used as a binder. The preparation must be made attractive to the prospective customer. The cereal and meat baits are wrapped in contrasting paper so that the eradication man can distinguish one from the other and thus can learn which bait the rats prefer. The poisoned baits must be placed where the rats can easily find them. It would be too much to expect the rats to search for them. Bait is placed along runways and near customary sources of food. To kill as many rats as possible before they develop an aversion to the poison, a generous supply of bait is used. Rats seek food where they have previously found it. They are usually suspicious of any change. However, in the absence of their regular food, hunger will induce them to accept any food they can find. Rats in the open are normally nibblers and samplers. They usually eat a full meal only in the safety of their harborage. For this reason, the torpedoes are made in a convenient size for the rats to carry away for later eating.
Each torpedo contains enough rodenticide so that if later it is shared by two or three other rats, each rat will receive a lethal dose. Red squill takes from 24 to 72 hours to kill. When a rat has eaten red squill, it usually becomes lethargic in one to two hours. Four to 14 hours later, characteristic tremors begin, followed by progressive paralysis. If it can, the rat will return to its harborage. Thus, death usually occurs in the nest. Since up to 90% of all rats poisoned with red squill tend to die in their nests or in secluded places, it is difficult to determine how many rats have been killed. A checkup in the restaurant kitchen two days after setting out the poison reveals lessened rat activity. A definite odor of dead rat coming from behind the stove guides the eradication man to one of the rat casualties. Hmm. Another rat, dead before it could get to its nest. Judging from the smell, there must be still another rat in the hole. Unfortunately, it is out of reach in the double wall. Ripping out the wall would be expensive. The best thing to do is to cover the odor with a masking agent, such as isobornal acetate. Have all the rats been killed? Well, that's hardly likely. The best way of finding out whether any rats are still living is to put down some patches of talc or pyrophyllite or 10% DDT dust to make rat tracks easily visible. A patch approximately 12 by 18 inches and about 1 8 inch thick is spread and smoothed with a straight edge. Smoothing will make it easier to see the tracks clearly. Because rat signs age slowly, it is impossible to tell from them the progress of day-to-day -day eradication. The tracking patch is the best way of determining the extent of rat activity during a given night. The tracking patches are laid along the rat's principal routes between food, water, and harborage. In view of the rat's limited home range, patches must be so placed that every rat present will traverse some patch during the night. Too few patches, or patches poorly placed, can give a false impression that all rats have been killed. Early the next morning, the patches are examined with a flashlight before the kitchen is cleaned for use. The first patch is smooth. This patch clearly shows tracks of several rats. The flashlight is held at an angle of about 30 degrees to the floor so as to throw into relief the impressions in the dust. Obviously, the job is not completed yet. And by now, the surviving rats have probably developed an aversion to red squill. Therefore, the rat control man decides to use N2 to complete the kill. N2 is unique in that it can be used as a tracking poison. The control man removes the old patches in order to avoid diluting the N2 mixture. N2 is specific for Norway rats, while roof rats have a high tolerance for it. Next, the control man lays down new patches consisting of a mixture of 20% Antu dust and 80% pyrophyllite. Even though expensive, Antu is economical when used under ideal conditions. In this case, the rats have become accustomed to tracking patches in their runways. It is virtually certain that the rats will come into contact with the rodenticide.
In their search for food, the rats run through the antu dust. The dust irritates the rats' paws, causing them later to lick their paws, thus ingesting the antu dust. Antu causes an overproduction of liquids in the rat's lungs. Within 48 hours, the rat dies as though by drowning. When no rat tracks appear on the tracking patches for five nights, the eradication man knows the restaurant kitchen has been freed of rats. Rats may re-enter a rat-free and rat-proof building through an open door or with merchandise deliveries. To maintain the kitchen in a rat-free condition, frequent inspection is necessary. Inspection must be at regularly scheduled intervals so as to find any reinfestation as soon as possible. Sometimes the rodenticide selected does not work too well. In this fish market, torpedoes containing red squill bait have been tried, but for some reason have proved ineffective. The surviving rats will no longer take the red squill bait, having developed an aversion to it. Since the rats have been feeding mainly on fish and fish scraps, the eradicator decides to use arsenic trioxide in a fish bait. The arsenic trioxide is added to an emetic, in this case tartar emetic, and weighed carefully. The tartar emetic is intended to protect animals other than rats by causing them to vomit the poison. Poison and emetic is added to the fish. Finally, the bait is prepared in torpedoes. As an alternate bait, ground breadcrumbs and ground bacon are mixed with the finely powdered emetic and the arsenic trioxide. This second bait is made into torpedoes. Again, contrasting paper is used to distinguish them from the other bait. In the fish market, these poisoned baits are readily taken by the rat. Arsenic trioxide is a poison which is absorbed into the rat's intestinal tract, causing gastroenteritis, destruction of kidneys, exhaustion, and generalized paralysis. Death usually occurs in less than 24 hours, although in a few cases where minimal lethal doses are eaten, it may take up to six days. To check on the possibility of any rats surviving, tracking patches are put down. In this case, the patch is laid in a 15-inch radius around the rat hole, making it impossible for any rat, using the hole, to avoid leaving its tracks in the patch. Thus, well-placed tracking patches offer a check on the effectiveness of any specific treatment. In addition to indicating the presence or absence of rats, tracks found in such patches often indicate the size of surviving rats and the number of rats using the runway. Such tracks are also a clue to the direction and purpose of rat travel.
only when an adequate number of properly placed tracking patches are free from rat foot prints for five nights in succession can the premises be considered rat free. A quick acting, highly toxic rodenticide such as 1080 water can be used only when the premises can be effectively closed off to humans and animal pets. When the area contains food, it is necessary to cut off all sources of water and rely on the rat's thirst to force them to take a waterborne poison. 1080 water is placed in waterproof, non-spillable cups. 1080 is a very dangerous poison. Only trained and experienced eradication men should be permitted to use it. The utmost precautions must be taken whenever 1080 is used. Rats must have water. 1080 water is tasteless, odorless, and quite acceptable to them. One swallow is a lethal dose. Ten eighty kills within one half to two hours. For some unknown reason, a high percentage of rats killed with ten eighty die in accessible places and are easily recovered. Convulsions precede death by heart failure. The next day, the first order of business is to count, pick up, and dispose of cups and carcasses. Dead rats and every used 1080 cup should be incinerated. Only licensed and qualified eradication men should be permitted to use 1080, and then only under carefully supervised conditions. With 1080, as with other rodenticides, tracking patches are laid to determine whether all the rats have been killed. This basement storage room has been rat-proof, but colonies of rats still remain and have to be exterminated. The rat control man decides to try another rat poison, warfarin. Warfarin was originally known as compound 42. Strictly speaking, it is an anticoagulant, causing a slow bleeding to death. It is tasteless and odorless. One effective bait to use with warfarin is cornmeal mixed with a discoloring agent such as activated charcoal to warn against human use. Warfarin, mixed with yellow cornmeal and charcoal, is placed in a bait box near a rat entrance. The purpose of the bait box in this case is not to prevent human access, but to avoid the poison being kicked and spilled accidentally. The use of such a bait box is optional. The box contains enough bait to last until the next service date. A tracking patch is spread around the bait box to indicate the presence or absence of rats. Another bait box is located near a place where the rats have fed in the past. Tracking patches are placed around this box also.
During the night, the rats are attracted by the bait and approach the box. As no other food is uncovered and easily available, the rats investigate and find the food to their liking. Unlike other poisons, warfarin does not create an aversion in rats that eat it. They come back again and again. Rats often show a preference for warfarin in cornmeal over other foods, even though the other is unpoisoned. The next day, examination of the tracking patch shows the rats' reactions to the bait. They have eaten so much that it's necessary to replenish the supply. The effect of warfarin is cumulative. Repeated doses over a period of several days will gradually weaken the rat by loss of blood. The rat usually dies between the fifth and eighth days. The slow, cumulative effect of the poison delays the rat's death for several days. Thus, warfarin is dangerous to domestic animals only with repeated ingestion. Despite its safety features, warfarin must be used with caution, placed in a bait box or in inaccessible locations where humans and household pets cannot get at it. With warfarin, just as with all other rodenticides, tracking patches are needed to indicate the presence or absence of surviving rats. For 10 days after the last rat was found dead, there have been no tracks around the box. Yet another patch near the rat entry hole shows the tracks of more than one surviving rat. Since warfarin won't complete the job, the bait boxes are removed but the remaining rats must be killed. The eradicator decides to use steel traps. He selects one, carefully sets it at hair trigger, and places it at an opening to rat harborage. Because a steel trap does not kill the rat outright, it must be securely fastened so the rat cannot drag it to his harborage. To force the rat to cross the trap, the eradicator puts a box on each side of the trap. The boxes are pushed back against the platform to prevent the rat from turning aside to bypass the trap. After setting out sufficient traps, he puts out additional tracking patches and smooths the old ones. The next morning, inspection shows that one rat has been caught in a trap and is still alive. Another trap has evidently been sprung and dragged around, but there is no rat in it. The tracking patch near the rat entry reveals a rat's footprint. Since the eradicator now has made the rat shy of steel traps, he prepares expanded trigger wood traps and places them in the rat runs and near food. A rat is caught, probably the last rat. Tracking patches are re-smoothed and observed daily for five days. Since no rat footprints are found, the storage basement is considered to be rat-free. Thereafter, as in all rat-free premises, inspection must be made at regular intervals. For this purpose, tracking patches laid in dark, out-of-the-way places provide a permanent inspection record. There are other types of rodenticides, and as time goes on, more will be developed. But regardless of the rodenticide used, safety for human beings and small animals 
as well as effectiveness against rats must be considered. For greater safety, an emetic can be added to many rodenticides. Dangerous poisons with which emetics cannot be used should be handled only by qualified personnel under conditions that present no peril to human beings or domestic animals. By observing proper rat killing techniques, rat proof premises can be completely freed of rats and kept that way. Rat killing by itself, without sanitation or rat proofing, must often be used as a temporary emergency measure. In substandard areas, there are conditions like these, garbage, rubbish, rat food and harborage everywhere. Sanitation appears to be unknown. Obviously, under such conditions, rat proofing is impossible. Financial help may be needed to improve or rebuild the section. Individual and collective efforts to clean the place up may take a long time. Everywhere there is evidence of rat infestation, carrying with it a constant danger of rat-borne disease. There have been several reported cases of children being bitten by rats. The health officer and sanitary engineer are faced with a real problem. According to latest health inspection reports, three blocks in the area have the highest incidence of rat bite in the entire city. A survey has shown that the same three blocks are in the center of a large area that is heavily rat infested. Poisoning operations are planned for this area. The first rodenticide to be used is red squill, the safest rat poison known for residential areas. Four baits are selected, fresh fish, fresh horse meat, rolled oats and scratch feed. Each type of poison bait will be prepared in torpedoes wrapped in a different color paper. After preparation, the four types of torpedoes are assembled into one pile. Then they are thoroughly intermingled so that when they are distributed, the rats will have a complete choice of bait. The assortment is loaded into carrying bags. To take full advantage of rat habits, poisoning is planned on a block-by-block -block basis. The men form a working team. Each man is assigned a section of the area to cover. In any such program, the goodwill and cooperation of the residents is an essential factor. The men must inform the occupants of the purpose of the work, request them to confine pets, and not to allow children to molest the poison baits. Of course, with native populations, consideration must be given to their food habits and no baits used, which might be eaten under the compulsion of hunger. The eradicator then proceeds to look for rat signs. At places where he sees rat signs, he deposits clusters of the four baits. The occupant of each house is contacted. The work is explained and consent obtained for placing the baits. Experienced rat control men quickly pick out rat signs and place the bait accordingly. Active burrows and signs of gnawing indicate the need for a generous supply of poison. Here's a place for many rats.
Rubbish piles are logical places to expect rat infestation. Hedgerows and shrubbery are usually honeycombed with rat runs. The area is thoroughly covered. Bait is much less expensive than labor and should be used generously. At dusk, the efforts begin to bear fruit. The maximum kill is almost always achieved on the first attempt. Rats surviving the initial poisoning will become suspicious and avoid the poison bait. This initial area poisoning, therefore, must be thorough. Not only must the dwelling areas be covered, but the surrounding territory also. Poisoning must be extended to adjoining open areas that are reservoirs of rat infestation. Poison baits are distributed systematically, block by block, until the entire area is treated. After a week, an inspection is made of the area. Reports are collected on the results of the poisoning program. Reports show that results were satisfactory in more than 90% of the blocks treated. The remaining areas must be treated again. For the repoisoning, zinc phosphide is used with tartar emetic added. A new group of materials will be mixed with the poison. This time it is mixed with cubed apples. Zinc phosphide causes gastrointestinal irritation, cerebral involvement, and liver injury, usually causing death within 12 hours. As always, the poison is carefully measured out. In repoisoning, each step must be repeated. The change in rodenticides is explained to all householders, and the safety factor in the tartar emetic is pointed out. The men work swiftly but carefully, seeking out rat signs and distributing a generous supply of the poison bait. The repoisoning was successful and accomplished the temporary control sought through area poisoning. But much remains to be done. In order for the beneficial effects to last as long as possible, the inspector must instruct householders on how to cut down available rat food and to remove rat harborages. Education and enforcement in sanitation must be constant and progressive. The inspector studies the evidence of rat infestation on each premise before contacting the occupant. Thus, he will be able to make specific suggestions on solving the particular problems of each premise. One successful device in this educational work is to tag inadequate garbage cans to emphasize to the owner that replacement is required. A specific suggestion might be the removal of a board fence or elimination of shrubbery giving the rats access to open windows. A courteous and constructive approach to the residence will usually evoke interest and full cooperation. Several weeks later, three blocks out of 41 originally poisoned require additional treatment and are scheduled for repoisoning. To keep down the rat population in substandard areas is a never-ending job, as long as environmental conditions make available the basic requirements for rat life, namely food and harborage. In the long run, substandard housing must be eliminated, and new construction of rat-proof design provided. When sanitary practices become habitual, depriving rats of their food supply, 
when rat-proof buildings are erected and maintained in good repair, reducing rat harborage. Then, rat killing becomes the final and conclusive measure in an integrated program of rat control.